Thank you. Thank you for the organizer and the committee giving me the opportunity to present um, our new work here. So today I'm going to talk about the inverse molecular design of green, chem uh, green catalyst for converting nicotinocellulosic biomass into liquid fuels. So first I wanted to, uh, in, in case you want to visit us, uh, just tell you a little bit about where is uh, University of New Haven. It's actually uh, located at uh, Connecticut, um, so it's a small state relative to other biggest states in the United States. And we're not too far from Boston and also New York. Um, in fact, it's uh, not too far from the Yale campus. It's about 15 minutes driving. Uh, it's also very close to the ocean. Uh, so sometimes in the morning, they can see the seagulls and sea, and, and it's sort of beautiful. Um, and also, I came to the university in 2000, um, just last year, um, 13. So I, in fact, um, I studied the laboratory of uh, integrated material discovery, basically use different uh, competitional methodology based on ab initio quantum chemistry or molecular dynamics, uh, try to build a ma material design laboratory. So, and we have a competitional lab in Orange campus. And also we set up uh, about 300 uh, cores of computer clusters in the IT department of the university. So first, talk about the biomass conversion. So we all know that the biomass is a very important uh, source of renewable energy. And because the reason is, if you use biomass, you're not producing any extra amount of carbon dioxide. Because our mother nature actually take care of us. Uh, when you, first, you, when you have these uh, dry crops or dying woods, when you convert that to liquid fuels and you burn out with release carbon dioxide, however, those will be absorbed by uh, grain plants again. So then for the whole cycle, you do not have any extra uh, carbon dioxide emissions. So for that reason, it's not going to be, it should be to categorized as a green chemistry. And however, that we know, you know, using these uh, dying crops or um, woods, it has a long history. People in you know, old history, people just burn woods and then generate uh, energy to use as heat. However, that in nowadays, if we wanted to uh, really get high quantity oils or liquid fuels, and you really need to have a, some efficient, robust, and cheap catalyst can actually um, convert that easily and more efficiently. So if you first look at the uh, biomass polymers, um, there are three, category, uh, three main category of biopolymers. First is cellulose, it's about 40 to 50 percent. And uh, hemicellulose is about 25 to 35 percent. And also you have ligulin, it's about 15 to 20 percent. And when you look at the chemical um, structures of all these polymers, you see the one feature you can notice is the CO, uh, C or the ether bonds in all these um, chemicals, um, polymers. So you wanted to degrade them into small molecules and hopefully you're going to convert that to alkanes with uh, uh, carbon numbers of six to eight that will be used as liquid fuels. So the main work is trying to uh, degrade these polymers and one thing, um, you know, there are many ways of doing that. And one catalyst that I found is very interesting is in the literature published by uh, Professor Ford from UCSB. And they actually use hydrotelcite in the dope with the copper. And then just for one pot reaction, it's about for the reaction about 30 degrees C. And then they, will, they can convert all the biomass. They try that for ligulin and also cellulose and then convert that to liquid fuse. But the question is, you know, the temperature is still relatively high, it's about 300 degrees C. And also, they're using a, uh, a supercritical methanol, which is in very, relatively high pressure as well, if they uh, do the degradation. So the question is, can we actually come up with more efficient catalysts and also can work under mild conditions? So itself will be uh, a key consideration for green chemistry as well. So I would, as a competitional chemist, 
And I would like to introduce a new tour to solve that problem. And this tour, we call that uh, TBLCP inverse molecular design. Um, and I would give you a workshop in a couple hours and try to focus on what is that methodology, what's the math or the quantum chemistry behind it. Um, so, but now I'm going to just show you uh, how I have used that before and then how I use that for solve these uh, green catalyst design problem. So if you think about the like the design problem itself is not a trivial problem. People actually estimated if you have uh, tried to explore all the possible chemical structures for molecular weight less than 200, uh, sorry, 500, then you will end up to, uh, 10 to the 200 possible chemical compounds, which is a gigantic molecular space. Uh, in one sense, it's, it's bad news, it's hard to find something useful for you. And, but in another sense, it's good news because it will, for uh, Future generations, they always have a job to do as chemists, right? And however, that for as a theoretical chemist, uh, we look, we have a problem. We are thinking about a question: is if you construct a property and versus the structure um, surface, and so you will probably end up something like Himalaya mountains, which means you would have a lot of structure will be a, will be the peak of the mountains. And which would be a local optimum structure, and and probably you would have something like a really global optimum uh, structures. So that would be the landscape of the hypersurface of the of the property and the structure. And traditionally, people rely on the the fact that the molecules are discrete. So the molecule they don't have a mathematical connection continuously. So then what they do is they use the stoichiometric uh, algorithms like Monte Carlo genetic algorithms, so you have functional groups, you just try to do all the combinations, you have some uh, smart algorithms like genetic or Monte Carlo, then you would screen out the one you don't want, you keep the best one uh, that you can possibly get. But the question is, you do not have any knowledge in principle to know that is the local optimum and not even the global optimum as well. So what we uh, when we work uh, in the project for molecular design for, for non optical materials, we came out of the idea of doing things differently. We think if we can have some guidance in terms of the search of these um, hypersurface, and we can actually do better work. So the version we came up with is to rely on the gradient of the property versus the structure. So in that case, then you would actually have a guidance to always point you to the top of the mountain. So when you were at the top of the mountain, you know that the gradient will always be going to be zero. So you're going to stop there. Okay. So and this is uh, in sort of this version we call it linear combination of atomic potential, and we call this inverse molecular design because we came up with the top of the mountain and then we map up the structure. So it's a sort of inverse way of doing. Uh, molecular design instead of you, you come up with some structure, you do a calculation and see if this is good or not. So that's, we think it's kind of a direct um, way of doing design. It also, it's, it's a useful way, it's a most straightforward way. Now, we came out this version and then it was first applied in 2006 at a DFT level of theory. Uh, of course, DFT will be a um, more elegant method, it will be more accurate calculation, but the question is you, the computational cost is or, already is also high. So when I was doing PhD work at Duke, I, come up, I came up with the version of LCAP at the time binding framework. So I use adaptive continuous methodology to the time binding framework. In that case, that is supposed to actually do things faster. So, here I'll give you one example why TBLCAP will be more efficient compared to the uh, disagree version of molecular search. Um, so for example, if you think about, I give you this uh, molecular framework, it's all pi conjugated framework, and I say each side I give you three options, it could be carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, you will still keep the pi conjugation for the whole molecule and there, was, there, there will still be real structure. And however, if I have 40 sites, they are variable, which means the 40 sites, um, I will have to determine should, should it be carbon, nitrogen, or phosphorus. And then for the, out of these combination, um, 
library, you will find out that the total number of molecules is 10 to the 19th possible molecules. So if you want to enumerate all the possibility, you have to do it 10 to the 19th possibilities. And I, we estimated with a single computer, it would take you about a year, even at the tie binding level of theory that we're doing. So however, that if you do LCAP search, is equivalent to about 10 to 14 uh, molecular structure calculations. So it's much doable. In fact, I actually uh, use this structure and then run the LCP search as well. So here is the, so give you a few more examples the, as the uh, molecular frameworks that we use. I use about 10 molecular frameworks here. The, the sizes varies. And for those, uh, for two to Nine, they have a 10 to the six um, chemical structures, possible chemical structures, and for the 10 is really large, 10 to the 19th. And then we actually optimize them with, with optimized for the nonlinear optical property. So for the nonlinear optical properties, which means when you have two photons, you hit the, hit the material, that material can convert that two photon into one photon. So that's usually a, the application for nonlinear optical materials. And then when we look at these optimized uh, structures, we found that they all have the feature of asymmetry in terms of the distribution of chemical elements. And then this is consistent with the knowledge in the field of nonlinear optical materials. People know that when you have asymmetry structures and you actually get good nonlinear optical material. So that actually verify the current existing a design framework, people usually use donor bridge acceptor framework for the nonlinear optical material design. You actually verify that's a good uh, design framework. Of course, uh, that actually tells us the algorithm that we're using actually works. So the beautiful thing about these is we are using the gradient to search these molecular space. When you look at the gradient, um, so they give you the guidance, but you have to mathematically make it sound, so you have to actually have gradient. So when you look at this PowerPoint here, um, you will see that's the space, of the hypersurface we actually uh, relied on for the search. So if you have, uh, you know, I allowed the one to two uh, sides to vary uh, from NC to nitrogen, carbon, diatomic functional groups to nitrogen, nitrogen, uh, diatomic functional groups, and then for the side of 10 and 11, and then I change from phosphorus, carbon, diatomic groups to nitrogen, phosphorus, diatomic groups, you will see the whole surface is, re is relatively smooth. So for that, it's the gradient of all these is well defined. So if you start from anywhere, and then you will always hit you to this point. When you hit to that point, then you, you will point to a structure. And also, we estimate efficiency of these algorithm. We actually find out that the uh, when you increase, here is the S-axis is the size of all the possible chemical compounds out of the library. And then the efficiency is the time that you, it, you try to enumerate all the possible structures versus the time you do one LCAP search. So you can see that the efficiency is actually going up when the size going up for the chemical libraries. So first, I just before we get to the use these methodology for catalyst design, let's warm up a little bit, just apply that to a, another important problem is for optimizing the photo uh, absorption. And I noticed the previous uh, speakers actually have some similar uh, question as well. So basically when for the dye sensitized solar cells, people actually use is they put the dye onto the TiO2 and then um, the question, when I, when I work as post at Yale, they have the problem is, they know they have a catalyst, a photocatalyst that can actually do photooxidation. However, that uh, the photoabsorption is not so strong in the visible light range. So what they want is, how about that, uh, I, I use the methodology and then try to improve the photoabsorption for this dye. But the question is, this is not a trivial problem because when you, you enhance the photoabsorption, you could also lose the electron transfer property, you could lose the binding probability to the uh, TiO2 surface as well. So here is the one framework that I 
I chose, this is the phenol agate framework, and I allowed them to have different functional groups for the rectangular shape, it could be carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and sulfur, and then all over shape, I have the CO double bond, CS double bond, and CH single bond. And then when I do a search, and here you can see the search actually works because we have a guidance, we always start from some low point, and then it probably will go up. So at, eventually we hit some Piron agate framework, and that, that is the smallest unit you can get with the best uh, absorption in the vis, uh, UVVIS range. And this will be used as a lead compound uh, if people can expand that in different ways and will still work. And in fact, if you do a carbon, six carbon ring fused to the Piranha ring and you actually hit another commonly used uh, dye called coumarin in the dye sensitized solar cell uh, field. So, which means, and once again, that it demonstrate how algorithm actually works. And then our collaborator at Yale, actually, uh, Lauren, she's the graduate student in uh, CropTrace group, and she actually made some a derivative of this compound and actually demonstrate that absorption does improve and also stick to the TiO2 and the photoabsorption, uh, the in electron injection properties do good. Now, I would try my best to cover um, the idea about to adapt these to the uh, biocatalyst um, design, but I fortunately I have the workshop time as well, so I would go into detail when uh, I, I'm giving the workshop. Um, so first, when you try to design a catalyst, um, you, you first need to understand the mechanism, right? So um, I chose these uh, particular catalysts that I introduced at the beginning is because the mechanism of these catalyst is relatively simple. So because it, you, what it does is it use hydrogen to degradate all the biomass polymers. And then you have the hydrogen molecule and then it attack these uh, lignin model and then, and then so you saturate these seal bonds and then these will be released. So the, the transition state is actually the attack, it, the release of the hydrogen absorbed on the surface or the catalytic surface and then um, that would be the energy barrier. So we're going to optimize this energy barrier um, and hopefully show it will lead us to the new catalyst. So I'm going to quickly jump to the end. So I actually found is that if you put copper, ruthenium, and palladium, so I choose the copper framework and I choose these uh, three atom types as option for four atoms su uh, surrounding the active binding site of hydrogen atom. And then I run the optimization to see, to make sure the binding energy is as small as possible so the hydrogen atom can easily attack the, um, the uh, absorb absorbent. And you will see that binding energy keep going uh, getting go going up, which means the magnitude getting smaller, so the binding affinity getting smaller. And then we would eventually find out if you dope ruthenium with copper, and then you would actually get very good uh, catalyst or improved catalyst. All right, so this is the, actually the first demonstration of inverse molecular design for the biomass uh, application, uh, for the biomass uh, catalyst uh, application. And in any case, when you dope some noble metals will lead to uh, better affinity uh, or better hydrogenation uh, um, catalyst. In the meantime, also in my lab, we currently found there's also some non-noble metals that we can actually improve the catalytic cap um, capability as well. And all right, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, we can take about one question, uh, so we're right at the 20 minute mark for him, but uh, anybody have a question for him? Okay, if not, he will be having a workshop here right before lunch, so if you think of something, we can get those questions there as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.